so a bit about today as you know we, we have a steering group um that come together and and um plan the agendas for these sessions and today when we talked to the steering group having been to their mental health collaboration where we had um chris luby speak we all felt empowered to think about equality and diversity and equity a lot more so really today's agenda was with that in mind um so you'll very much notice um a theme through the day with that and finishing with rowan ward who who was going to share about their experiences of setting up a project and um, so very much our speaking today is, is around um that equality and diversity that's so important in our project and just to mention that we are working um with um community insights and surrey borders on a research piece particularly attached to reducing restrictive practice so when we have a bit more we'll share that and if anybody would like to know any more about that and um, please put it in the chat box because we can work um with with both with all our trusts on this as well and are happy to do so so without any further ado i'd like to introduce fran um from the national healthcare inequalities improvement program over to you fran if I could just remind everybody to put their speakers and cameras off. Thanks, Kerry. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, my name's Fran. I'm a policy and strategy trainee on the NHS grad scheme, and I'm currently based in the healthcare inequalities improvement team um, in NHS England. So I'm here today to give you an overview of our national approach to tackling healthcare inequalities in mental health. Um, so can we get the next slide, please? I think that might be our title slide. Yeah, perfect. So just the next one. Perfect. Thank you. So Core 20 plus 5 is our national approach to healthcare inequalities improvement. Now, this is aimed towards integrated care systems to ensure they're prioritising resources to address long term plan commitments that address healthcare inequalities. Now, it's important to highlight that healthcare inequalities improvement is incredibly broad and it would be unreasonable to ask ICSs to solve their populations inequalities overnight. So to make this task more manageable, we've identified the need for a focused approach that allows us to gain traction, thus demonstrating impact, which is core 20 plus five. Next slide, please. Fab. So to put this all into context, the long term plan sets out key commitments for health inequalities improvement. Um, for example, continuing to target a higher share of funding towards geographies with high healthcare inequalities, um, enhanced target and enhanced and targeted continuity of care model for vulnerable mothers and babies. Um, and it stresses the importance of building relationships with VCSE partners to understand your population um, and develop best practice models. Um, I've just seen a comment that says the slides don't seem to be changing and um, I can see them. Can anyone else? I was just responding to that actually oh, Fran, because I, they're moving for me. So I, is anybody else having any issues? I, I can't see the slides. OK, so we've got VJ and Medicare can't see the slides. Um, Karen, do have any idea why? It might be a case of signing back out and signing back in, if not, um, for those individuals. Yeah. OK, sorry no, about that, guys. Now. Oh, that's good. Perfect, brilliant. Um, so further to the long term plan commitments um, in the 2223 operational planning guidance published just in December, this places a heavy emphasis on this focused approach by recognising that a key purpose of ICSs is, is to tackle health inequalities in access, experience and outcomes, which is our team vision that was on the first slide. Um, of course, we can't forget how um, much the pandemic has highlighted the disparities that we see in society regarding both healthcare and the wider social determinants. But I think worth noting is how the pandemic has had a huge toll on the mental health of the population. And mental health can be both a consequence and a driver of healthcare inequalities. So it's clear that urgent and targeted action is required. If we could go to the next slide, please. Fab. So this approach is very much driven by a quality improvement methodology. So this starts with a strengths based approach. So really understanding what works where. Understanding this allows us to build a best practice model, but also to understand the conditions under which it works best, because not everything will be so easily translated to different geographies um, and exhibit the same effects. 
Secondly, co-production should be the standard. So at the beginning of every patient interaction, asking what matters to you to personalise the care given and really develop those patient clinician relationships and involving patient and public um, voice partners and lived experience partners from the very beginning of the policy or service design process. And finally, our approach needs to be data driven. So we know where the needs are um, we need to know where the needs are in order to um, target the resources and we have our health inequalities improvement dashboard which is now live which provides the key strategic indicators for health inequalities all in one place meaning it measures monitors and informs actionable insight to make improvements to narrow health inequalities and we're really aiming to promote the to promote and improve the collection of ethnicity and deprivation data in particular um, so that data is cut with this healthcare inequalities lens and therefore action can be targeted. Um, and if you'd like any more information on this dashboard, either drop me an email or visit our NHS Futures page. Uh, next slide, please. So what does Core 20 plus 5 actually mean? So the Core 20 plus part is the target population, whereby Core 20 is the most deprived 20% of the national population, and the plus is ICS specific. So this might be the populations who most experience health inequalities within the ICS, who don't fall in the most deprived 20% nationally. So again, taking a really focused and targeted approach. The five is the five key clinical areas that have been highlighted based on the largest contributors to the life expectancy gap between the most and least deprived. I'm not sure if you can hear my teams going off, um, so I'm just going to mute that just in case you can. Um, so yeah, these are the um, these have been identified as they're the largest contributors to the life, life expectancy gap between the most and least deprived. Um, and within each, we have kind of a goal and objective. Um, so within maternity, we're aiming to ensure continuity of carer for at least 75% of black, Asian and minority ethnicity mothers and mothers coming from deprived backgrounds. For SMI, we're looking to increase the uptake of physical health checks to 75%. Within chronic, chronic respiratory disease, we're looking to drive uptake of vaccinations to prevent infective exacerbations. Regarding cancer, we'd like to um, have 75% of cases at least to be diagnosed by stage one or stage two um, within the next kind of six years or so. Um, and finally, we're looking to increase hypertension case finding to prevent cardiovascular disease. So that is core 20 plus five. Um, next slide, please. So to build on our mental health objective, we're proposing, like I said, to increase the uptake of physical health checks within the SMI population because we're aware that uptake is much lower in this population compared to the general population. And there are various projects currently going on to find out why this is. Um, so a really great example is um, a team in Cheshire and Merseyside um, have just begun a project that's engaging with the local community cohort of SMI patients to try and understand the barriers and facilitators to uptake of health checks. And this will hopefully inform um, service and pathway design. Um, this is still in its very early stages, but it's definitely something that we're going to stay connected with. Um, so hopefully we can share those learnings with you shortly. Um, so we'll look at the graphs um, in a little more detail now. So if we could have the next slide. So as you can see, individuals with SMI have a greater risk of a number of different conditions, um, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease and liver disease. So effectively targeting the mental health condition will alleviate this risk of comorbidity. And you can also see here that SMI is most prevalent among um, black ethnicities and much of the literature surrounding this stems, uh, states that this stems from racial injustice, um, racism, microaggressions. So this really highlights the wider problem that we have as a society to tackle this racism, to improve the health of those who experience it. And finally, on the right hand graph here, you can see that the prevalence of SMI increases as the level of disadvantage increases, with the prevalence being highest in obviously in the most deprived quintile, and it's actually triple in the most deprived quintile compared to the least deprived quintile. So there are clear inequalities in mental health that need addressing, and it's our job to do everything that we can to narrow the gap. Uh, next slide, please. 
So these are our support offerings as a national team. And I think I won't go into them all, but I think the one um, that's worth highlighting is our core 20 plus connectors. So the connectors are going to be people who are part of these communities who are currently underserved by um, existing services, who experience healthcare inequalities and who can then help to change these services to support the communities better. And this approach really recognises that people and communities often know what they need best and they know what would work and that the NHS needs to hear from these people and these communities. So we're currently in the process of launching wave one of the programme um, with 11 ICS sites spread across the regions, um, all of whom who have a focus on one of the five key clinical areas and will be working in a core 20 plus community. And I think at least four of the 11 sites have a focus on SMI, so it will be really interesting to see what approaches they take to empower and improve the mental health of their community. Um, and again, we'll hopefully be able to share this learning with you in the next kind of six to eight months or so. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in fact, so the support offers listed on the previous slide are kind of our proactive initiatives that we've developed, but I think it's also worth mentioning a piece of guidance that we have. Um, so we have this document called the Health Inequalities Improvement Planning Matrix, which is a tool aimed to support programmes to ensure they're addressing healthcare inequalities improvement in their policies, projects, initiatives and so on. It's split into these seven sections that you can see on the slide here and under each section there are tools and resources to support um, programmes to address this specific area, including any contact details um, of relevant teams who may be of further help. And this is a great way to approach any programme of work to ensure that we're working towards narrowing the gap. So I'm going to whiz through um, all seven of these just to give you a flavour of what you'd find underneath each. So next slide, please. So the first area to highlight is equitable access. So providing the same for all won't close the healthcare inequalities gap. And there are times where unequal provision of resources and attention is required to address inequalities. And this is why Core 20 plus 5 is so important, as it's a targeted and focused approach that highlights the greatest areas of need. So systems should really be aiming to ensure that no patient group is excluded and highlight where disparities have been observed and what could be done to address them. Next slide, please. So the next section is co-produced delivery models. Now, Co-production is a vehicle with which to drive healthcare inequalities improvement, and it's important that we encourage systems to incorporate a diverse range of voices and perspectives from the very beginning of the policy or project design process. And this ensures that the needs of the target population are properly understood and no patient group becomes excluded due to any unintended consequences that, that weren't considered. Next slide, please. So as I think I mentioned earlier, um, it's critical that systems are cutting their data with the healthcare inequalities lens. And again, this involves disaggregating the, the data by ethnicity and deprivation, and also inclusion health groups where possible. So for example, those with a learning disability or um, gypsy Roma travelers, for example. Um, and this really allows systems to understand where the inequalities lie and where to focus their efforts. Next slide, please. So similarly to the co-produced delivery models, community participatory research involves co-design and co-production um, of research with people with lived experience in the particular um, research topic. So this ensures that the right questions are being asked and the research is as far reaching as possible in terms of the populations that it um, encompasses. And this diversity of perspectives also ensures that no relevant recommendations from the findings are missed as well. So this ensures that the research has kind of maximum impact. Next slide, please. So moving on to culturally competent communication, um, this surrounds the idea that health messaging and any form of communication should be culturally sensitive. And this involves a few things. So firstly, considering the health literacy of the target audience, so making sure that information is accessible and digestible. It also concerns considering any language barriers with particular groups of patients and what can be done to address this. And systems may also wish to consider who or where the health messaging is coming from to ensure that it's delivered in an authentic and relatable way through a raft of credible voices, um, which again may be achieved through co-production or co-design with the relevant community or patient group. Next slide, please. So I'm aware I'm whizzing through these. 
Um, so multi-agent support, uh, multi-agency support um, refers to partnership working between the voluntary sector, local government and the NHS. And this was employed with great success during the vaccination programme, um, which led to a huge increase in vaccine uptake from particular underserved communities. So here we're really trying to encourage systems to ensure they're considering where there are possibilities of consulting multiple different organisations that they may be able to collaborate with to perhaps produce work of either a greater quality, work that's more inclusive um, or service kind of design and delivery that's as innovative and sustainable as possible. So final slide for the matrix, please. Oh, sorry, just one. Yep, there you go. Um, so as mentioned earlier, to address healthcare inequalities, resources should be distributed fairly and in relation to need. So health equity audits, which are also known as um, EHIAs, can be used to identify health inequalities um, between different population groups when you're undertaking a project. So I'm now going to go into a bit more detail on EHIAs um, as they're a critical first step in ensuring a programme of work looks to advance equality rather than contribute towards inequality. Um, so if we could have the next slide. Yeah, perfect. Um, so as we're all aware, and as I, of course, mentioned earlier, the pandemic has shone a harsh light on healthcare inequalities. And as such, whilst not mandatory, every policy should undergo an equality and health inequalities impact assessment at the earliest stage possible. And people's understanding of this has really grown massively since the pandemic, because everyone's keen to make sure that services are more accessible and to make sure that we don't leave anyone behind. So we conduct EHIAs to ensure a policy, practice or programme is not going to inadvertently harm a particular group, whether that's individuals with a protected characteristic or who also experience healthcare inequalities. And promoting equality and addressing healthcare inequalities are at the heart of the NHS's um, values. So going through this process ensures that we are giving due regard to the need to eliminate discrimination, harassment and victimisation and to advance equality of opportunity and to foster good relations between people who share a relevant protected characteristic and those who don't and to give regard to the need to reduce inequalities in access experience and outcomes from healthcare services and to ensure that services are provided in an integrated way and where this might reduce health inequalities. So during this process you should be noting both positive and negative impacts uh, for all groups and when potential negative impacts may occur or have been highlighted, mitigations should be implemented. And of course, we can't um, do everything and we can't reach every single group or community at once, but we can put extra measures in place to ensure that no one is negatively impacted. So regarding the legal um, obligations behind these, we have two distinct duties. So firstly, the equality obligations come from the Equality Act of 2010, which is only concerned with the nine protected characteristics that are defined by the Act. Then the NHS has broader duties to tackle healthcare inequalities through NHS legislation, such as the Health and Social Care Act of 2012, um, which I think is actually um, going to be developed um, and republished very shortly. So the scope and the duties of these two legislative frameworks are fundamentally different. So while people with certain protected characteristics, such as um, those with a disability or those from minority ethnicities, will often disproportionately experience healthcare inequalities, the focus and reach of the legislation specifically on health inequalities goes beyond this by bringing in um, deprivation and inclusion health groups as priority areas as well. Um, which is what's done in the Core 20 plus 5 approach. And so whilst there's some kind of commonality of aim between the two, um, they are distinctly different. But nonetheless, completing an EHIA will assist us to meet and provide the evidence that we're meeting these legal duties. So here I've listed a few considerations to make um, when conducting an EHIA. Um, however, the guidance kind of in its fullest form can be found online. It can be found on our futures page. Um, but it is worth noting that it's important that the EHIA is done as early as possible. Um, and it's a live document that can be revisited um, and revised at regular intervals. And it's also important to consult sources of evidence and engagement. So, for example, um, research findings or lessons learned from previous projects, those with lived experience, relevant staff networks, etc. There's loads out there. 
Um, so it's actually the patient equalities team that have the internal role um, of making sure that policies and practices take into account equality and health inequalities. So they're responsible for everything regarding EHIAs. So if you do have any further questions, I think probably your regional or local equalities lead is probably the best person to go to at first. Um, however, like I said, you can find loads more information on our futures page um, and I've linked in here as well the email address for the patient equalities team if you wanted to contact them directly. If we could have the next slide, please. So one really great example of EHIAs in action and how to hold your teams accountable is um, the National Mental Health Team's Equality Governance Structure. So I'll quickly run um, you through this because this I thought this was really great. So to inform the formation of their structure, all teams were required to review their EHIAs and present them to their National Mental Health Equalities Lead. And this allowed for the development of a whole team EHIA action plan, which was taken to various stakeholder groups, including the Mental Health Programme Board, um, to demonstrate what they've been doing to advance mental health equalities. So this then led to the formation of check and challenge session, check and challenge sessions, that's very difficult to say, um, for mental health policy teams, which are held every six weeks. And during these sessions, one um, team will present on what they're doing to tackle inequalities, which will allow for kind of peer learning, for the team to be asked questions and gain feedback. And they've had this in place for about 12 months, I think. So also what they've got in place are bi-weekly equality progress updates, um, during which a nominated member of each team gets together with the inequalities leads and provides a status update on their projects. And then finally, they have um, established an annual equality action plan meeting. So they all get together, they reflect on the progress of the last year and agree objectives for the coming year. So I think this is a really great example of how a team is taking responsibility for reducing healthcare inequalities um, in mental health specifically and how they're holding their team accountable. And um, it is worth noting that every element of their work is co-produced, um, both with their lived experience partners and clinicians. Um, of course, the importance um, of which I touched on earlier. Um, and this approach as a whole kind of ensures a holistic, a transparent approach to advancing equality and avoiding a very kind of siloed approach that we can see too often. Um, so final slide, please. So. Thank you so much for listening. I know this has been a lot of information, but I hope it's been helpful. Um, I've left my contact details um, and the email address for the wider team here in case you've got any questions following the session or you'd like to connect. And I can provide you with um, any supplementary information. I can provide you with the matrix if that's helpful. Um, so I will pass back to Kerry. Fran, thank you so much. That was very informative and it makes me realise how complex the area is and, and how much engagement is, is crucial at the beginning. Um, I'm going to open the floor up to questions, but before I do that, I wonder, Fran, if you could put the links to futures in there and some of the links to you mentioned around matrices so that people don't have to go and hunt for them. But um, opening the floor up for questions for Fran. I don't think we had. We've got some um, questions, we've got some comments as well, but I'll just leave a couple more minutes for questions. I think there's one um, in the chat about the composition of um, Core 20 plus 5 group slash team. Shall I come oh, yes, to that from, one? Yes, please, um, Miriam. So our team, so we're called the Healthcare Inequalities Improvement Programme and we are rapidly growing. So we have um, a policy unit and a um, clinical unit. So I currently sit within the clinical unit, um, but I do work closely um, and kind of across both policy and clinical teams. Um, and Core 20 plus 5 is kind of we don't really have a Core 20 plus 5 team. It's very much an approach that was devised by pretty much everyone. I think it started, the team was only formed last January, so it's kind of been in the making for the past um, year or so, and it was um, published officially just before Christmas. Um, I hope that helps answer that one. I'm seeing another question about how we identified the five key clinical areas, which is a really great question. And these were all, I think actually, um, 
bar mental health, these were all identified as they are the largest contributors to the life expectancy gap between the most deprived and least deprived. And I think um, that mental health was identified due to the differences, um, the inequalities between different um, specific communities, I think particularly different um, ethnicity backgrounds. Um, I can double check that, but um, yeah, it's because of the life expectancy gap. Thank you, Fran. Sam, did you want to? Did you have a question for us? Did you want to come in? No, I mean, I was, I was just no, I was just, like I was particularly curious about some of the work you mentioned that I think Cheshire and Merseyside are doing around um, physical health checks for SMI, and I know that's been a, a really sort of hot topic. Um, I work for the AHSN as mental health lead, and um, in Kent, Surrey, and Sussex, and, it, and it's something I think that all our sort of ICSs across the southeast really are struggling with in terms of kind of trying to think about how we can improve sort of the uptake but also I think intervention as well so it's not just about kind of screening is it's actually doing something kind of meaningful and um, I think again I, I'm particularly interested in the in the in the working with with kind of service users and communities to, to better kind of develop you know and understand I suppose those barriers um, mm. to, to accessing healthcare so yeah so I mean I'd be, yeah, be great to kind of hear a bit more about that as and when those kind of results come through. Sure, I can provide you with um, some contact details if that's helpful. That's great. Because, um, yeah, I'm really hoping that, um, so I got a very kind of brief overview in a conversation that I had with um, Chris Davies from their team. Um, he said he was going to pop me over some more information. Um, but I'm, I, what I'm really hoping from this is not only will we understand the barriers and facilitators for up uptake of health checks, but their kind of health seeking behaviour in general. And this can then inform interventions, um, like you say. So hopefully it's got kind of policy and clinical implications, which will be really interesting to see. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thanks, Tam. We've got another question from Tamsin. Um, it would be great to link up as I'm working community mental health transformation. It'd be great to have a chat further about this. Yeah, let's do it, Tamsin. <laughs> if you like, <laughs> great. Email. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll pop it in the chat. It's just a lot of what you're saying, especially about SMI and um, health checks and uptake of that and ethnic minority communities um, is essentially what I'm working on right now so it'd be great to do some co like co-production I guess with that um and I know I notice at the moment I'm working in the sort of ethnic minority community and BAME now is actually not um uh they're saying on the government website that it's not what the correct terminology but they haven't actually also put in what you should use so a lot of the work I'm doing at the moment is they're saying like ethnic um minorities or my not minority ethnic communities and stuff so i know the language around that as well is a bit sort of not very clear in terms mm. of us presenting so i know we can probably have a chat about that as well but if i pop my email in there would you be able to pop those email addresses in the chat as well because they're you can't copy and paste from the presentation if that's okay yeah, I'll pop um, everything that I've linked to in the presentation. I'll pop in the chat now. And but I think it would be worth sending the matrix around because I'm not sure that there's a specific place online for it. Um, but I'll double check. I think someone in my team was working on this this morning. Um, and you're absolutely right about the language. I'm writing a piece of policy at the moment and it literally came to my attention yesterday that we need to change that before we send for publication. But you're right, I'm not sure what to replace it with. So that conversation would be really helpful. I was, yeah, I was talking to the Kent Equality Cohesion Council yesterday and we've had a chat around sort of correct language. So I can share that with you if we can sort of catch up. But also thank you for the presentation. It was great. Thank you, Tamsin. Thank you. We have another hand up. I can't see who it is. I'm so sorry. Does somebody want to? Thank you. <laughs> oh, hi, Psycho. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't see you, Psycho. No, 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 it's OK. It's fine. Um, it was just on the back of what um, I just heard Francesca say about language. It's something that uh, we as an internal team have discussed and we have um, people with lived experience in our internal team. And it was something that one of the uh, people with lived experience mentioned and said, look, you know, she dropped into one of the meetings and she said uh, ethnicities was just used and uh, she really wanted to challenge that and said, what, do, what does that even mean? And so for sure, uh, you know, I think the, the discussions around languages is, is really important and we would never just we would never kind of prescribe that. And, and I'm talking about work on a completely different collaborative, which is advancing mental health um, equalities. And that's where this conversation came about. And um, I personally hate the hate the word BAME. 
because what does that even mean? It's lumping a huge group of people together to kind of be like, oh, this is just all the non-white population. What does that even mean? Like, what is Bain? So it's, I think it's always helpful to ask people, um, what do they want to be referred to as? What do they, how do they want to be described as? And I think people forget to, to consult people and ask people, okay, well, what do you think would help for you? And you might not get one straight answer from every single person, but I can, as a brown person, I can say I don't like that term because it just lumps a lot of people together. Um, and we're not one homogenous group. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's really important conversation to have uh, with, with populations when, when you're talking about um, the language and what terminology is used. I, I agree, Cypher, and I think it takes bravery from everybody to be confident enough to, to ask those questions at the beginning of a meeting as well. Um, and, and sometimes one we forget and sometimes there's an awkwardness. These conversations are difficult sometimes. And I think we all need to get better at that. And the only way we're going to get better at that is to link up and have these conversations. Got another hand up from Sam. Sorry, yeah, I, I, I just oh, fallen. Could we say another? No. Oh, another one, another one, another <laughs> hand. Um, I, I think it was just following on from that. I think absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, so much of what we're trying to do is about, you know, address inequality. But, but you know, the, the data, I guess, is, is, is what's going to kind of steer that. And if we don't have the correct data because we don't we don't feel able to ask the questions in the first place um, around people's ethnicity or how they identify, whether they've got particular protected characteristics. And I think recognising that it's also a fluid situation as well. So it needs to be revisited, you know, every time, a, you know, a person is seen. Um, and I think we need to get better at asking the question and, and, and also being able to have those kind of reciprocal conversations around what's getting in the way, because I, I know for some of the, the sort of the large integrated data sets that we're trying to create across the healthcare system, you know, the ethnicity data, for example, that's just, just one protected characteristic is, is, is shockingly low. It's sort of 60 percent. So, you know, we've only got 60 percent capture of data. We don't really have a fair representation of our population. We don't know what we don't know and, and how do we intervene? So it's it's kind of I think we all need to get better at kind of being open and honest and transparent about why we need information and, and how best to kind of you know, get the right information. So mm -hmm. as a I'm, reflection. I'm thinking and thinking about psycho, what Psyche said, has that mm -hmm. impacted in the way that person recognises or is it on a, a cold you know, incident report or something like that. Yeah, and, and even I, I was watching something on TV the other day and it was talking about people of dual heritage is going to be the, the largest kind of population in, I think, can't remember, in, in 15, 20, 10, 15 years time. And so how, how are you going to capture people of dual heritage or what people yeah. just describe as mixed race? How, how is that going to be captured? So it's like thinking ahead, like you know that this is where the population is going. So what you when you when you're thinking about your data sets and how you're going to capture information you need to be proactively thinking about it not responding to as and when yeah. something happens yeah but you're absolutely right and uh, we did a, a review recently of um some national clinical audits and we looked at the way that they were recording ethnicity data mm -hmm. and i think they'd used um in a, a, a group of um audits from the past um year i think they would use about 30 different terms um for different ethnicities um different backgrounds you know so we need to have some kind of standardization as to how it's recorded as well if we're going to get that really really good data to be able to target our approach as, as i was saying earlier so yeah really great points thank you i think it i think there's some um merit in here when we talked about how difficult it is to do the eias um and and those policies and i think there's something about joining up our partnership here in this network to see if we can reduce that workload so i think that's something out of this meeting i need to think about and we probably need to think about as teams together as well when we come together in our learning sets with people like psycho as well we can have those conversations there as well i'm going to move us on for, for time but if you've got any more questions and um, please put them in the chat box for, for Fran I'm sure she'll come to them and, and watch them and if not if you think of some in a day or so you can send them to us and we'll forward them on and um, so thank you so much Some lively conversation from that Fran so brilliant and um, so we're going to move on to our next um, speakers um, Toppy, Miriam and Helen from um, Sunny Borders and um, so without further ado I'll go off and hand over to you Toppy, thank you. Hi, thank you everyone. Uh, Bav, are you happy for us to share our slides or are you happy just to continue? We can, you can um, share if you'd like to, Karen if you want to unshare and then Toppy can 
thank yeah. you. Yeah. Just so there's a there's a point in our uh, presentation where it uh, kind of slows down a little. So, um, all right, let me just I'll take over sharing and hopefully you can see this now. Um, right. right. Are you all seeing my screen? Yeah. Oh, yes, fantastic. I can see it, Toppy. Brilliant. Uh, so I'll just move us along one just uh, so you can see the intro slide. So I might just in invite my colleagues, um, Dr. Miriam and uh, Professor Helen, just to join me on screen, just so you know that there's three of us going to present. So I'll, I'll go first, but um, uh, just want you guys to say hello. Um, so we are uh, literally off the back of that last bit of conversation. Um, this is what we're going to talk about around inequalities in in, um, in BME staff um, and and hopefully, I think, yeah, what we talk about will will address some of those issues also. Um, so my name is Topo Forsyth. I'm a senior improvement advisor. I work in the quality improvement team. I'm also a member of the BME uh, staff network and I was project lead on this program. Um, and this program is around reverse mentoring um, a pilot that we, we undertook in SABP. And I'll just ask Mary and, and Helen just to say hello and introduce themselves quickly. Hello, I'm Miriam Maria Zions. I am a counselling psychologist working for SABP within a community mental health recovery service. Fantastic. I was a mentee on the reverse mentoring, sorry, a mentor oh. <laughs> within the reverse mentoring project. Fantastic. Thanks, Miriam. And uh, Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Helen Rostel. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive at Surrey and Borders and also the Director of um, Therapies. Um, and I was the mentee um, on uh, the uh, reverse mentoring programme uh, with Miriam as my mentor. Great. Thank you. I'll hand over to you guys shortly. Thanks. Um, so as I've already introduced who I am. As I said, I was a project lead in this but I didn't do this alone um, so we had a group of us um, who led on this so we were all uh, BME members um, in the, the BME network um, and we de delivered this program and it's it's it, it's finished but it's ongoing um, so I guess starting from the beginning so what is reverse mentoring um, ideally it is it is generally sees a younger or less experienced person helping or being matched with a more senior a manager to gain insights into certain areas through exchange of skills, knowledge and experience and understanding. Um, and I, the idea is that it has the benefit of bringing together these powerful um, people with someone who's you know, theoretically less powerful. Um, and so we we started this program in March 2021 um, and we launched this pilot. Um, we had funding through an NHS charities um, together pro, um, uh, funding stream um, and, and this funding came from the BME network, staff network. Um, and I said as our ambition was to around reducing the inequalities um, experienced by staff from the BME backgrounds, uh, working in the trust and with the hopes of understand, helping people to understand what their experiences are. Um, as I said, it's le it was led by members of the BME network um, and what we wanted to try to do was to support our, our trust commitment around our workforce race equality standards, uh, our action plans uh, as led by our, our uh, res expert and chair of the network, Ali Khan. Um, so the programme that we delivered, we saw we had 52 participants in all, in all 26 members of um, staff from the BME backgrounds. Um, ranging from across all the different professional groups from different levels um, from band three upwards up until a very senior um, uh, director of a BME background and they all entered into relationships um, where they acted as experienced and trusted reverse mentors to the mentees um, and the our mentees were made up of the whole of our trust executive uh, and non-executive board members as well as senior leaders um, so, as I said, these mentors entered into this relationship, so they were sharing their own lived experiences, they were subject matter experts in their own experience. Um, 
and uh, and the idea is that they met monthly over a period of six months um, during that time receiving some peer support having reflective um, sessions throughout and I'll share with you in a second just what that kind of looked like um, and, and these relationship really helped our BME reverse mentors to be heard um, and helped the mentees to understand as I said the, the challenges that they face um, in the trust um, highlighting some of the barriers that they experienced and and they sought to look for opportunities for learning and opportunities to improve um, on, on this. Um, and, and I think one of the, the key things that kind of came out of this was actually helped the trust board and senior members, um, leaders involved with the ability for them to be able to competently represent and advocate for the interests of um, our BME staff colleagues in this. So let me just move this along. So we didn't do this on its own. Um, we had to use a, uh, a tried and tested framework. So we used the Remedy framework and, and that sort of stands for Reverse Mentoring equal for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And this was um, kind of a creditor, our, our, our Professor Stacey Johnson, MBE, who, who devised and, um, and created this framework. Um, and the approach really helps us to ensure that the delivery of the program was consistent with our values and priorities um, while focusing on the EDI, uh, the equality and diversity and inclusion um, aspects. Um, and so the particular model in which we used was the race model, which you, you can see on screen here, which helps us to really focus and deal with those issues around inclusion and facilitate those difficult conversations um, um, that are different to the ones that we normally have um, around race. Um, and it helped us to to really acknowledge that it's it's uncomfortable, um, but um, we we step through that and and help us to put the emotion and humanity back into those conversations. Um, key to delivering this was uh, as, as in the framework um, helps us to kind of look at what we need um, to 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 address these. So organisation having that whole organisational commitment for this, having the sponsorship resources. Um, having the space for people to 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 meet um, the leadership and the support from the BME network, uh, our chair Ali Khan, in driving this, the bravery and and um, and the the vulnerability of our mentors and mentees who volunteered to be uh, on this program, um, as well as actually being supported and sort of having that sort of protected space um, for a lot of our our mentors who who who. We needed to essentially have that protected time, one hour a month, to meet with someone, um, and, and and conversely also for the mentees, focusing and protecting that time to do this. So that commitment was really key and important. I think we we really got there. Um, so as I said, they, they everyone met um, for around six months, around six hours, some slightly different timings, but um, I'm sure um, Helen and 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 Miriam can share some of that with them. But as part of the framework, it was really important that people uh, prepared for this. Um, we wanted to absolutely acknowledge what their fears, their hopes and dreams of this was for both the mentors and mentees and, and shared, shared that with each other. Um, so this framework really allowed us to, to ensure that, um, that everyone going into this would, would have the tools and resources um, and tips to help facilitate those difficult conversations. Um, but very key to supporting this was the, the project team and, and the support that we facilitated, um, the supervision and, and mentoring that we provided for um, both mentors and mentees who could approach us at, during those times. Um, and as, as I said, so that connectivity that they had um, was is key to the, the framework, so having peer-led um, support, um, we had um, monthly sort of drop-in sessions, but I think everyone kind of went to them as and when they could. Um, having the the mentors being supported to to kind of facilitate conversations around um, what they were going through and some of the challenges, the progresses that they were having, and really troubleshooting some of the, the experiences. Um, while providing that reassurance and restoration, kind of giving them a bit of a, a boost to keep going in those relationships. Um, so in terms of where we're at, and uh, we're still 
evaluating the programme. It's I think we only came to a, a close officially in January this year. Um, so we are still in evaluation, but we are what we're learning is that it's been very impactful for a lot of relationships. Um, and as I said before, that you know, a lot of the programme was meant to be six hours over six months, but I know that a, quite a few more people have met more than that um, and have continued those relationships. And uh, in a second, I would want to hand over to my colleagues, um, Miriam and Helen, just to share a bit of, about their experience. Um, and so I'm not going to say any more from there. I'm going to be, invite you both to come along. I don't know who wants to go first. Um, Miriam and Helen. Thank you, Thank you. Helen and Helen. I are going to jointly present our journey and our reflections during the reverse mentoring project and now well after the re reverse mentoring project. The reflections Helen and I derived from this project were as a result of our own experiences, mainly in the workplace, as well as from listening to our colleagues who took part in the same project. We decided that there was so much to share and learn, so we were able to prioritize our meetings, doing so every other week instead of monthly. In our presentation today, we will talk about some of the reasons Helen is where she is and I am where I am. We will finish with Helen describing the practical steps the two of us are planning to take and have already started to take as we make attempts to shift the status quo locally within SADP and more widely for those people that will come across our electronic blog. We are going to do so using a pictorial representation of our journeys, which we will generalize at the end of this. Can you put up the next slide, please? During our interactions, I got to know about how Helen got to where she is now. Hers is a story that depicts hard work, intellectual ability, talent, and dedication. Next slide, please. When she embarked on her training as a psychologist, Helen was exposed to opportunities. She was given options, and yet there were challenges along the way. She demonstrated great determination and focus. For her, for her hard work, Helen was supported. She was recognized. She was rewarded. She was promoted to senior positions of power. She was listened to. She was incentivized. She was included and empowered, which helped her to develop and to grow. Next slide, please. Having said that, Helen's journey was not always straightforward. She came across bumpy moments and rocky paths. However, overall, Helen's journey demonstrates success in the face of challenges. The next bit of the slide, please. Topway. Thank you. I'll pass you over to Helen. Thank you, Miriam. And I'll just identify myself uh, in this uh, picture as uh, the character that is at the top of the mountain. People can see that. Miriam's journey. So Miriam was named for wisdom as a child. She's carried that wisdom with her. She's got great intellectual ability, uh, winning a scholarship to Oxbridge. She's courageous, persistent. But along the way, Miriam has encountered repeated obstacles her journey has been thwarted, she's been redirected and misdirected, disadvantaged and excluded. Miriam grew a passion for psychology, uh, wanting to become a psychologist. She was um, 
advised by colleagues that this wasn't the route for her. You don't see black psychologists. She persisted, she was courageous in following her ambition and training as a counselling psychologist. Within her training, she was actively discriminated against. Supervisors who refused to take her on placement, who made lame excuses whilst offering placements to white students. Supervisors who forgot to complete her paperwork, which was essential for qualifying. Supervisors who found her difficult, threatening. So Miriam's journey has been one of obstacles all along the way. Miriam, do you want to identify yourself? Thank you. I am that person you see on the bottom of that mountain with the large backpack and a barrier on there. With the two people up on the mountain holding hands and I'm all down there stretching my arm, hoping that something will shift, somebody will reach out because I have everything it takes. Though I do not have the privilege of whiteness. The two people on the top of the mountain are close enough to each other, as you can see, not only to, to, to hold hands, but also to support each other. And I'm all alone down there with a hand on one of my feet, which looks like it's doing something there, but what is that something that is doing? Is it pulling me down? Is it anchoring me down? So that is difficult to move up. The massive barrier in the way between myself and the person I'm closest to is so large that it, in, it also increases the chances of me ever going to the top there. And this is not because I don't have, as I said, what it takes. This was a journey that was not easy and qualifying as I did was not a mean feat. While this was a journey that Helen and I put together because of what we experienced, we listening to our colleagues, both the mentees and the mentors, realized something else about our journey and about the journeys of other people. Before we generalize how this was realized as a journey of other people, I'll pass you on to Helen briefly to discuss and talk about the emotional impact of my journey. Thank you, Miriam. So being a mentee on this on the reverse mentoring program has been one of the greatest privileges of my career. And a huge uh, opportunity uh, for learning. When I heard Miriam's story as it unfolded over the course of our meetings, it filled me with great sadness um, to hear about how people had actively tried to extinguish her hopes, extinguish her light, misdirect her and discriminate against her. But she continued that her courage um, was, was um, so evident in every conversation that we had. I felt angry and aggrieved for Miriam, um, but also a great sense of admiration uh, for her and, and all she'd encountered. Uh, and, and dealt with in her journey. I recall giving feedback um, in one of our um, mentee sessions uh, to Stacey Johnson, who was leading the programme, talking about um, the early stages of our journey together in this, this process. And I was very positive about the work that um, Miriam and I were doing together and talked about 
the many similarities that we have, both being psychologists, a lot of common ground in terms of children, grandchildren, um, etc. Uh, women of a certain age, shall I say. Um, and then uh, Stacey uh, stopped me in my tracks and said, well, if you're so similar, how come you're where you are and Miriam is where she is? And that caused a seismic shift for me, um, which um, I still um, strongly have a strong emotional connection with. Um, and in particular, it evoked senses of of guilt and shame. Guilt that although my journey had been bumpy, it had not, nobody had ever, ever tried to wrong foot me on the path. Uh, and shame that I am part of a culture that actively discriminates against people who are so talented and brilliant like Miriam. Um, so it has been um, a real intellectual journey, but an emotional roller coaster. And we have had to encounter some difficult conversations and go to, to some very um, difficult and deeply emotional places in our conversations and to face that with courage and openness and honesty. I think it's still me, isn't it, to talk about levelling up, Miriam, or, yeah. So, so, um, so, so, you know, I, I think it's really important that the reverse mentoring actually uh, is a call to action not just a reflective process that we actually think about what we can do to to change our culture and the way that we work together it's about the hand that's holding miriam's leg becoming a helping hand a hand that boosts gives her a lift over the obstacles and it takes courage it takes courage from the characters at the top the middle managers to reach out the hand to lift people over the obstacles. So um, I think there is a role for us in our leadership to be that helping hand to reach out to to give people the boost that they need to overcome the obstacles. Miriam. Thank you. When that happens, next slide, please, Tofe. When that happens, this is where, as you can see, the gap is narrowed. The ledge, which was like a barrier, is now something that is used by the middle management to reach out, to step on and reach out so that they can reach the person on the bottom. And as I said, in terms of generalizing, this is not just my story. Listening to my colleagues on the project and listening to the mentees on the project, it sounded like a lot of the people on the project who are like me, people of color, had gone through similar marginalizations, being disadvantaged and being discriminated against. So it wasn't just me. And whilst the details of my story are as you had, the impact that they have had on me and other people like me is similar to the impact that other people like me stories have been, though the details have been slightly different, but with the same sort of marginalization. And as Helen said, Hers and my story couldn't be more similar, yet they couldn't be more different. In that picture there, we start, we appear to start off all at the same point with the two people on the left wearing the white tops, having propellers on their feet to propel them forward, and the person on the right having those barriers those anchors to anchor them on to the ground and delay 
any move they may, they may make. Something needs to shift. And when we talked about this, there was a lot of so what from the whole group. So what, where do we go from there? This was, yes, very emotional. Yes, we got a lot of understanding. Now what? In our own small way, Helen and I have agreed to do what we can for SAVP and for slightly a slightly wider group than just SAVP. And Helen will talk about some of the things we are planning to do and what we have already started to do to level the playing field, or rather to start leveling the playing field. Thank you, Miriam. So, so, um, so we are continuing to build our relationship. Um, we had a wonderful meal just before Christmas uh, together. We are continuing to meet. Our next meeting is 24th of March. We'll follow that with another meal. So we both like food. So we're exploring the restaurants of Guildford uh, together, which is which is great. We've got a few more to go. Um, we keep in touch with each other, but we also hold each other in mind. Um, Miriam reaches out to me from time to time to check that I'm OK. Uh, and and that's been so powerful and so helpful to me. Um, we're writing a blog together, so we've been planning this for a while. Our blog is entitled Dear White People, We Need to Take Action Against Racism. And it's a direct response to a blog that was written about dear white people, we need to talk about racism. Well, we don't need to talk about it, we need to do something about it. And our words need to have legs. They need to, to activate people into action. Um, through our relationship, I've um, created a bridge for Mariam to our um, director of therapies who reports to me and they're working together on a psychology mentoring program and also on a supervision policy to um, provide more inclusive support for colleagues. Uh, so I'm really excited to see the outputs of that. And um, you'll see from my background that it's uh, International Women's Day um, and uh, tomorrow, in fact. Um, and um, I'm launching a, net, a women's network and uh, Miriam uh, is supporting me in that um, and has uh, recorded a video as part of our launch of the women's network, which is fantastic. So I, I know that she's going to be a great colleague, uh, a great supporter uh, in that uh, and will give me um, great counsel. So, um, so I'm very grateful for that. So, as you say, in our own small way, we are trying to make to be the change that we want to see in our whole organisation. And once again, I'd just like to end by thanking Miriam for um, for being my mentor, for taking me on this journey and uh, really for transforming my uh, insights around racism within our organisation. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, yeah, any questions for us? And I just want to say how powerful hearing you tell each other's stories were. Um, you know, I think you took me through a range of emotions that made me feel uplifted at the end, which was, um, yeah, you know, to hear that friendship and that link going on is, is wonderful. But I won't hog the floor. <laughs> questions, everybody. Sam. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I echo your, your, your thought, your words, Kerry. I mean, I, I think I was taken on a, on a real emotional roller coaster, and I'm actually sitting here with a bit of a tear in my eye, actually, because actually, it made, it, it, I, I, yeah, I found that a very emotive and very powerful story, and it, it made me, it made me just think how, you know, how we do kind of create change, kind of at scale, and how, how we kind of, you know, how, how kind of we proliferate and, 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 and spread um you know be better sort of ways of working with each other and and, and make cultural changes and 
and and, and it, yeah, it's it's just kind of it, it's kind of how yeah how how we kind of expand on on some of these kind of on the on these great kind of ideas and these great you know it, the ultimate is about forming relationships, isn't it? And these you know trusting each other, being able to share each other's stories. And I think I think as you said, Helen, it, it's easy to see the things that we have in common because that's that's the lens we like to see things through. We like to see how we're the same, but actually being able to recognise difference and being able to sit with that difference when that's really uncomfortable and difficult at times um is, is perhaps when we can best shift our own biases um so you know thank thank you for sharing that and I'd, yeah i'd just be keen to kind of yeah be involved in 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 spreading spreading this great work i think it's, it's absolutely fantastic i think spreading's the key isn't it mm. with anybody else there's lots of comments in the chat about um how powerful um amy's mentioned what a powerful presentation she's got lots of likes on that is there any any more questions for um, Helen, Toppy or Miriam around that or anybody would like to share what they're doing in a, in a similar way? That's fine. Again, if you'd like to add any questions in or come back um, to have a little think. Oh, we've got a question. I can't see who it is. Hi. Hi, Sarah. hi, sorry. <laughs> sorry, hi. Um, thank you ever so much for that. Um, I was going to ask on a very practical um, level, you were saying about the, you know, the call to action. Mm. How would you suggest might be the best way of approaching racism if you hear it or see it in the workplace in a way that is um, respectful but firm and compassionate but it's it's that balance isn't it that if you want to stand up for someone um or, or let your voice be be heard and take that stand it are there any suggestions of how best to do that sorry Sam. I just wondered who you were asking the question. Oh, and all of um, us. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, Let's go to Miriam. Well, I'd actually quite like to hear from all three of you, if that's OK, because you may have a slightly different take on it. And I think that can be quite insightful just to hear the, the, the sharing. Uh, Miriam, would you like to go first? Sure. So as it happens, uh, not long ago, somebody said something that sounded very much to me to be racialistic and racist. But I'm not sure that they did that intentionally. So I needed to be quite careful how I approached it because I did not wish for the person to feel that they had to defend their position. So. I waited until they were able to speak with me alone. And I went back to that moment when they said what they said. And I asked them what they thought other people heard from what they said. And they said, well, what do you mean? And what else could people hear? I said, do you think people might have also heard this particular message from what you said, which would sound racist? The person went quiet for a moment and said, well, it's possible. And I said, what exactly did you mean? If it wasn't racist, what did you mean? And they said, well, now that you are asking me, I'm not sure what I meant, but it was a general point. But it really wasn't general because it only applied to certain groups of people, not because those certain groups of people had something a characteristic that was a trait of them. It was more about their race. So I think being quite compassionate in how we do it, finding the right time to do it, and also realizing that sometimes it's it's implicit. It's really unconscious. They didn't perhaps intend to cause any offense. I think that way people will be more able to reflect and be reflexive in how they are processing what they said and how other people might have heard what they said. So I am not too 
I don't know what proper English word to use. I am not afraid to share my opinions. I have learned not to because for a very long time I've minimized and ignored and normalized things that are actually not normal, things that should not be normalized. So I do think that if we all, as people, as the human race, when we hear things like that, find moments when we can address it, but address it in a way that will allow the other person to see our point of view. Thank you. Thank you. I know, Helen, you okay. need to go. Did you yeah, want to? Uh, thank oh. you. Well, I'll come in really quickly. Um, just, just to say, I mean, uh, I think Miriam's given us a beautiful uh, example of, of how to challenge with compassion. Um, but, but I think it's um, it's easy to be a bystander, and it's easy to walk on past when we see uh, racism happening around us. It's not easy to stop and challenge and have those conversations. It takes great courage to do it. It's easier to think it's somebody else's job or somebody else's responsibility to challenge it, but it isn't. It's our responsibility. Um, and challenge using a psychologically safe framework, as Mar Miriam has set out, with compassion, mm. kindness. However, we work in an organisation that cannot tolerate racism. We just cannot. We have to stand up to it. And where we see it happening, we need to challenge. Where we see it happening persistently, we need to take firm and positive action against it. Thank you, Helen. I'm not sure I could add much more to what the, they both said, so um, I, I second all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. And, Thank you, and Chuck, great. Ray. Thank you, McBull, as well. And Miriam, of course. And NECA. There's loads of us in here as well. Yeah, Thank <laughs> everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much for Thanks. that rich conversation and, and a great question, Sarah, for promoting that. So thank you. I thought it was quite a hard one to answer. So I thought it was answered really, really well. And um, I'm just going to, I've realised we've run over slightly, but I think it's really important. Everybody has a, a few minutes to, to have a reflection time and grab a cup of tea and think about some of the things that we've we've said and we've had quite a rich conversation so we're going to go to tea break um, and we're probably off the agenda there was a connecting conversation so I think we've had some quite rich conversations now so we'll probably go straight on um, to our later presentation if we need to. Welcome back I hope everybody's back from break and I hope everybody had a chance to have a little thinking time and grab a drink much needed um, I think um, that was a great first session and some really th thought provoking um, conversations from both um, presentations. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Pete Stevens um, next uh, on behalf of the Prevention and Management of Violence and Aggression Partnership. Hi, Pete. Welcome. I'll, le I'll hand over to you. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kerry. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, as Kerry says, I'm Pete Stevens. I am the currently the Violence Reduction Lead at Summing Borders Partnership. Um, but I am here uh, more on behalf of the wider PNBA partnership, which I'll talk about in, in just a moment. Um, basically, my session today is just to talk very briefly around uh, the new Mental Health Units Use of Force Act. I say new. Um, it, it's, it did, of course, achieve Royal Assent back in 2018, but uh, uh, due to all sorts of delays, um, it took a long, long time for there to be any sort of real concrete movement with it. Um, but we're now at a point where um, this is very, very imminent uh, towards going fully live. Um, so I just wanted to have a little bit of discussion around around that and exactly what it is and what some of the main um, sort of immediate ramifications and consequences are for healthcare providers, particularly mental health trusts such as uh, ourselves here today. Um, so the Mental Health Unities Force Act is a piece of legislation that um, has come into place following the, um, or initially following the death of Olashoni Lewis. Uh, Olashoni Lewis was a young black man who was uh, detained in SLAM, NHS Trust, um, and uh, he was uh, unfortunately killed following a, um, a disproportionate and inappropriate restraint 
um, whilst detained by um, a, a weather police coming to visit the service. Um, his family uh, works tirelessly campaigning uh, with the local MP, various different bodies, various different agencies, um, and that culminated in the um, introduction of this legislation. Um, the uh, piece of legislation itself is designed to give um, uh, a, a oversight and accountability to all use of force within mental health units, and I will explain a little bit more about those. Um, but of course, what it also hopes to do as part of that is uh, be able to um, look at where we might see uh, groups of people that are more likely to be um, disproportionately restrained, um, inappropriately restrained or subjected to excessive uses of force. Um, and certainly data in the past as evidence that people from a black or minority ethnic background um, and also women and girls are more likely to be uh, disproportionately restrained. Um, next slide, please. Oh, and uh, next slide, please. Um, so just before I go into that, as I, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm here sort of representing the PNBA partnership as opposed to just Surrey and Borders. Um, the NHS PNBA partnership is a collection of currently five um, NHS mental health trusts, uh, all located within uh, the southern part of England. And essentially what we are is uh, we are a, a group of trusts that individually have our own self-governed uh, violence, res reducing restricted practice strategies, um, and uh, our own in-house training programs. So we all individually have um, our own ways of working, um, which are unique to our own trusts and to our own services and our own populations. Um, but we come together as a wider networking group for best practice, external quality assurance, um, and it enables us to have that self-governed status, but at the same time still have a really wide, varied and relevant network to, to call upon. Um, and one of the nicest things that it does um, in, in which is which is a rarity in the in the PMBA world is it allows us to do a substantial amount of work without there being any kind of commercial bias or interest in what we do. Um, so that everything really is just about ensuring that patient and staff experiences is put first um, without any kind of financial incentives or, or commercial biases getting in the way of that. So I'm, I'm here to speak on behalf of, of all of those five trusts um, today. Next slide, please. Um, so <clears throat> I gave you a little bit of an introduction as to um, how this piece of legislation came about. And as I say, it's um, you know it's designed primarily to ensure that any use of force within mental health units um, are uh, done in very clear light of the legislation and guidance available. Um, and that there is accountability for any use of force and transparency around the processes behind those. Um, the legislation I said was passed way back in November 2018. Um, a long, long time went by before we saw anything else. Um, the statutory guidance was published in December last year following a uh, consultation period that was open between May and August, which uh, everybody uh, across the country had the chance to uh, to contribute to. Um, Organisations, um, so in, in our cases, NHS trusts uh, are expected to be compliant with this legislation and the accompanying statutory guidance by April, um, so only around three three weeks away. Um, and I'll spend a little bit of time in this session talking about exactly what that looks like. Um, I will just say before we move on, my, my slides are incredibly text heavy and uh, are more or less lifted straight from the guidance um, so that the slides will act as a standalone resource without relying on me speaking over them. So I will just uh, paraphrase the, uh, the slides rather than go through, but the uh, the text will be there when the slides are shared out to everybody. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the legal status of the um, uh, statutory guidance um, is, is a really important point to make um, in that this legislation um, is essentially designed to sit alongside other bits of existing legislation that apply to mental health services. So um, the Mental Health Act being a uh, probably the, the most key one. Um, so nothing about this legislation is necessarily designed to change anything about how we work under the Mental Health Act or the Mental Capacity Act or, or, or other such piece of legislation, but they sit alongside that. And the statutory guidance um, should be seen and followed and um, 
adhered to in the same way that we would um, adhere to the Mental Health Act Code of Practice. That's the, the status of, uh, of, of, of this particular uh, piece of legislation and the guidance that accompanies it. So it's, ve it's very groundbreaking that it's the, it's the first time that we now have um, legislation um, that oversees this really key area of practice um, as opposed to just lots of pieces of guidance. Um, therefore, it's important that everybody within a mental health unit has regard to this guidance from the designated responsible person, which I'll explain about in a moment, um, all the way down to um, staff that are going to be on the front lines, um, potentially and, and actually using force on people. Um, there needs to be as much familiarity with this as there is for any other piece of legislation that is being used on a daily basis. Um, where there is any um, uh, area of the guidance that is not being followed um, or is not being adhered to in a way that um, would be deemed appropriate, then there needs to be clear and cogent documented reasons for doing so in the same way that if we were to work outside the um, uh, prerequisites of the Mental Health Act uh, Code of Practice, there needs to be very clear cogent documented reasons for departing from that, as that could um, give rise for scrutiny from courts. And it is an area that the CQC will actively now be looking at and inspecting um, from April onwards. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to quickly define exactly what a mental health unit is, it's one of the, for, for considering some of the content of this um, uh, legislation and the accompanying guidance, this, this is one of the areas that causes a lot of the confusion. Um, so a mental health unit is, a de is a defined as any hospital or, or any trust or any organisation that provides a service for uh, mental health treatment to inpatients. Um, it immediately applies to any NHS service, but it will also equally apply to any independent or private provider that receives any kind of funding from the NHS to treat patients with a mental health disorder that may be restrained. So any of the bigger private organisations um, that the NHS work with or fund um, or, pro or provide patients to for care, um, will equally be um, bound by this legislation and guidance in the same way that any NHS trust will be. Next slide, please. Um, there are a number of different types of use of force and restrictive intervention. Um, the five that fall under this particular legislation are physical restraint, so the restraint carried out by people, uh, mechanical restraint, um, regardless of what type of device that might be, any type of chemical restraint, which would include rapid tranquilization, so anything where medication is being used to uh, solely manage behavior, um, seclusion and any type of segregation, uh, whether that be long term, short term or anything in between. Um, there are other areas of restrictive interventions um, and the guidance gives some reference to these, but these are the five areas where there would be um, full scrutiny and expectation of accountability for under the guidance. Next slide, please. Um, these are the sections of the um, uh, Act that are relevant to organisations such as ourselves. Um, the other sections either relate to the Department of Health and Social Care or the police or, 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 other, or other agencies. Um, all of these areas are the ones that apply directly to organisations such as NHS trusts um, and I'm going to quickly take us through sort of sections two through six which are the ones that have a lot of the uh, immediate ramifications for um, for uh, for practice. Uh, next slide. So um, <clears throat> what will be required is for every organisation to have what's referred to as a designated responsible person. Um, that's not necessarily a new appointment or somebody whose entire and full time job is working on this uh, particular role, um, but it needs to be a permanent member of staff at an appropriate level of seniority. And in most cases that were, I think we've gone forward on the slide there. Um, in most cases that is that will need to be somebody at executive level um, at Surrey and Boards, it's the chief medical officer. Um, each organisation will be best placed to select who their most appropriate responsible person will be, but it will need to be somebody of an appropriate level of seniority. It will be expected that person has the relevant skills and experience to undertake that role, um, have all the support of other senior management and have the necessary resources available to them. Unfortunately, beyond that rather vague statement, there's not a lot else to define exactly what that means, which could give rise to some issues along the way. 
Um, but there, because uh, certainly once you get to that level within an organisation, the amount of subject matter experts in the field are likely to be far less um, due to coming from all sorts of different areas. So there will need to be a significant amount of um, organisational work, uh, I, I imagine, and I would see in terms of making this work, uh, certainly for an organisation as large as Linnitus Trust. Um, it's also requested or, or, or uh, asked for that the responsible person attend any appropriate training in the use of force and be fully aware of the training that their frontline staff are um, participating in. Next slide, please. Um, there needs to be a policy on the use of force. Um, I would confidently say that the vast majority of organisations will have a policy on the use of force. Uh, the expectation will now be ensuring that it meets all of the criteria listed within the statutory guidance. Um, and there is now a requirement for any policy to be co-produced um, as, as far and as much as is reasonably practicable and appropriate um, with current and former patients, families and carers um, and, other, and other um, third sector organisations wherever possible, which uh, might not be an area that a lot of organisations are used to, to, to working with with regards to a policy. Um, there are 16 areas listed within the policy that should be covered as a minimum, and the expectation would be that any policy now covers those, plus anything else that is relevant to the organisation, um, and particularly making sure that the policy, although being one single organisation-wide policy, making sure that it covers all of the specific needs of any um, specific uh, uh, client group that you may get in different divisions and directorates. Next slide, please. There is an expectation that every organisation provides information about the use of force to patients. Um, so there needs to be accessible information available to any patient at the point of admission that uh, details in uh, ways and methods appropriate to anyone's understanding what those person's rights are with regards to force being used upon them. Um, there needs to be an understanding as to what governs that, what allows that, uh, what it should look like, what it shouldn't look like, um, and making sure that everybody's aware of exactly what they can do, can um, resist to, can um, uh, not consent to, um, but also making clear what things can be done even without consent and, and in what way. And again, just as with the policy, this information should be co-produced um, as much as is possible and practicable. Um, and should be published um, on the organisation's website as well as in hard copies for people. Next slide, please. Um, training. <clears throat> so there needs to be training in the appropriate use of force. Again, um, the vast majority, if not all um, organisations that this legislation will apply to will have training programmes in place. Um, what is now required is that that training is of a certain standard and meets certain requirements. Um, there's 11 broad topics included within the statutory guidance, um, but essentially this can be remedied in one swift manoeuvre by achieving restraint reduction network accreditation or using a restraint reduction network certified provider. Um, at Surrey and Borders, um, we, you know, we have our own in-house self-governed um, programme, which is RN certified, um, as do um, the other um, uh, organisations within the PMBA partnership either have them or working towards them. Um, but it would be expected that as of April, any staff who will use or may use force on patients must be trained and must be trained via uh, an RRN certified programme. Um, this can create a lot of potential barriers and issues due to the huge reliance on non-permanent staff. Um, a lot of the scoping that we've done would suggest that particularly when you start looking at agencies, um, you'll find anything between people being untrained to people receiving very minimal training that often will not be certified or provided by a certified provider. Um, this means that any staff that would be used um, from April onwards uh, who do not have the RN certified training, um, the expectation is there's clear and cogent reasons for doing so. Um, which um, is, is going to be difficult and it's going to be difficult to remedy in the uh, short and even media term. Uh, so it's going to be a, a very challenging area, I think, for a lot of organisations to ensure that not just that you have access to the right training, but that every relevant member of staff is receiving that training. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, and the recall and the use of force is the other uh, main and significant area that could have a lot of um, implications on current practice. So um, again, um, it is likely that most organisations already have a format of recording the use of force. Um, but now the amount, the amount and types of information required during those records um, are much, much more strict, much more rigid and much, much more varied than perhaps we have used to them being. Um, and not only that, but this information needs to be um, recorded in such a way that it can be fully reviewed, fully analysed and can be submitted to the Department of Health and Social Care so that national statistics can start being recorded um, so that we can start seeing and looking at trends and analysis of the use of force on a, on a nationwide basis. Um, that data should then be used um, within the respective organisation to um, look at future practice and have an understanding of the use of force incidents that goes beyond just the numbers. Um, and uh, Kerry mentioned right at the beginning of this about some of the work that's being done with Unity Insights that um, we're working with with regards to some of the work that we've been doing. And again, be more than happy to talk to people about that as we're hoping that this will sit side by side and hand in hand with a lot of the work that's being uh, required as part of this legislation. There's also some guidance on what is defined as the negligible use of force. Um, which is the very um, finite situations where it would not be deemed necessary to record the use of force. Uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, thank you for listening to that. I'll say you probably will want to look at the slides in a little bit more depth um, in correspondence with the uh, statutory guidance and the legislation, uh, but hopefully that provides a little bit of an overview as to um, what the legislation is, why we have it, and what some of those um, changes uh, and uh, impacts on practice we expect to see from April. Thanks so much, Pete. That was really great. And I think it's it's been worrying a lot of people, you know, the, this law coming in and how it's going to be adopted. So that's a really nice, clear um, view of, of what's got to be done. I've got a few questions for you myself, but I'm going to put it out to the floor first so it'd be great to um for anybody to ask Pete some questions if they've got any I mean that was a lot of information so just while people think a little bit please feel free to write them in the text if you don't want to ask anything out or again Pete and I can sort these questions out afterwards as well um, what are, in in the time scales to to roll this out, Pete? What do you think are the significant challenges for trusts? Um, I think the the, tr the challenges around training are going to be one of the one of the major ones um, because the, the, there is so much variety with regards to the training that's provided across different services, um, not just across. The, the the sector in general, but just across the NHS, you know, you could go to you could go to any NHS trust and find a completely different strategy, a completely different training program. That can be a good thing, but it does create a lot of challenges as well. It means that going from one area of work to another can mean that you are using completely different strategies, uh, incompatible strategies, um, and it's still unfortunately common. Um, uh, even, even in the days of the RN standards to find training programs that are still very focused on the restrictive interventions. Um, you might get a program that's four or five days in length and you spend maybe 75 to 80 percent of that learning restraint techniques. Um, and I think the problem with that is that if the only thing you've been taught in response to violence and aggression is restraint, then that's what you're going to use. Um, if the only tool you have is a hammer, if the problem looks like a nail, so to speak, I think that's part of the issue. So ensuring that training is is fit for purpose, appropriate, and is fully focused on prevention um, and de-escalation, and that even when you're looking at restrictive interventions, it's looking at those in the least restrictive way, um, with a view to an end, um, and uh, looking at a means of you know root cause analysis and factoring in care plans and risk assessments to help reduce those instances. So I think training is the big one, getting the right training in place. But then also making sure that you can train everyone that needs it, because um, it's one thing getting your own organisation appropriately trained when you're factoring in NHS professionals, agency staff and the, and the ever changing um, personnel that, that that brings. 
it's uh, it's a massive undertaking, a huge task. Um, and if you've got different trusts all asking for different training, uh, then it's going to be even more difficult. I know you link up in your partnership and, and you get a sense that they're ready to meet that challenge around training uh, across the partnership as well and, and surrounding trusts. I think people feel reasonably confident about their own permanent staff. Um, but I think that it's a it's a common feeling right across the board that non permanent staff are going to pose a huge huge challenge with regards to the right training. Okay, thanks, Pete. I've got a comment from uh, in the chat box, and um, thank you, Pete. These changes in training will definitely support. Oh, sorry, I've just had a message coming and cover it up. Apologies for that. Will support on de-escalation and prevention of violence, aggression within our various clinical areas and minimising serious incidents. Yeah, thank you, Seema. That's really helpful. In terms of um, the uh, sort of policy and, and and those areas, and there's a real emphasis this time, and that the whole um, paper itself is threaded through with service user voice, isn't it? I mean, every part starts with um, different areas of service user voice. Do you think that's going to be, a, do you think that's ha going to happen naturally? And do you think existing policies have that in, or do you think that's going to be a change as well? I, th I, I think it'd be safe to say that most existing policies probably have not been uh, co-produced at, at, at that level, certainly the level that's being asked for, um, if, if at all, certainly our, our own uh, have not been. Um, so the, the aim will be to ensure that they are, but then it's making sure that's done meaningfully. And I think that's mm -hmm. always been why, I mean, we've talked about this. So one of my biggest issues with co-production, it's that if you're going to, you're going to, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it properly. There's no point writing a policy, waving it under an expert by experience and saying, what do you think of that? And that, and then calling that co-production, which I, I think mm -hmm. might be the common approach sometimes because you've got no other option. Um, mm -hmm. But going forward, I think that yeah, that when when these policies are reviewed um, and put together, that that it need it will need to be done in 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 a different way to what we're used to. So that could be a challenge. Uh, I think just because of the nature of policies and the uh, the fact that they're often only reviewed on a very periodic basis, um, once a process is in place, it's unlikely to pose too much of a problem moving forward. Whereas training, just you know, if if you've got to retrain a workforce for thousand staff to make sure that they're appropriately trained. And then factor in the constant uh, turnover of, of staff and, and the use of non-permanent staff. Mm. That's a, that's a massive challenge. And that culture shift through de-escalation, like you say, you've just done five days of, you know, restraint training. And then how do you dial that back to actually that's your, you know, that's your last port of call, really? Thank you. That's that's really great to hear, Pete. And I think you've helped demystify that for a lot of us. Um, just final call out for any questions for P as I say um pop them in the chat box so we can revisit them or again I can link you up with Pete afterwards and we talked about the work with Unity Insights again um you can contact me and I can put you in contact with Pete and Unity Insights um anybody from Sussex Partnership or uh, KNPT would that, that would like to explore that further it's, it's it's proving a really good piece of work even early on um, so without any further ado, I'm going to thank you, Pete, and, and move on to Rowan Ward. Um, we heard last time from Amber Ward um, from Sussex. So this time we're going to hear um, reflections from Rowan Ward. So I'm going to hand you over to Toppy, Sherlyn, Noel, Barbara and Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. And hello again. Um... I think I was muted. Um, sorry, yes, we've got Barbara, we've got Noel and Sherlyn. Are you all there? Yes. Uh, yes, we are. Thank you. Hi, great. Thanks, team. Um, so, Bab, happy for you to continue sharing for us and we'll direct you. Um, uh, can you move on to the first slide for us, please? Um, thank you again. And and we, we're going to share with you, I guess, Bit of how we are delivering on this program in SAPP in Surrey and Borders, um, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleagues from Rowan Ward who will share their reflection and how they're doing it um, within their ward. Um, so can I have the first slide, please, or the next slide? Next slide, please. Um, so this is who we are. Um, 
I'll, I mean, everyone can introduce themselves in a second when they speak. Um, but I, um, myself, I'm Topoi Forsyth, if you weren't there earlier. I'm a senior improvement advisor. I'm also the QI sponsor for this programme. Um, so I guess the first thing to kind of focus on why this is important to us and why are we doing this in SA, SABP. So this national programme is something we've taken on board and we are committed um, to working on, and it's now been taken on board as one of our trust quality improvement priority programmes. Um, we are key and 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 um, are wanting to focus on to use quality improvement as a way to deliver on our ambitions, and so this is um, why we're using quality improvement as, as part of this um, uh, program. Um, it's helping us to focus on patient safety and, and the work we and our ambitions around our quality and safety strategies, and we're hoping that this by doing this work we will deliver on I guess three key ambitions. We hope to have that we will have safe awards and that we believe that um, the improvements in safety and experience of our people in using services, carers and staff um, on the wards will be improved. Um, and we want to also see learning at scale um, by increasing our insights and, and learning and what we know about um, some of our challenges and safety challenges, um, but also sharing uh, locally kind of driven improvement work um, within and across the trust. Um, and we highly believe that actually by doing all this work, we will also have um, better outcomes for our people. Um, and this is not just um, our staff, but, but our people using services, our carers, and um, just everyone who's connected to this piece of work. Um, so can I have the next slide, please? So we feel, and you know, excuse the imagery, um, but that actually we feel that one of the two of the key main elements are actually our uh, collaborative uh, leadership. Um, can I move the first click? In fact, click them both so they kind of come through. Thank you. Um, so the ingredients for uh, the delivery of this and successful delivery of this is firstly around our collaborative leadership. And this is where we've got um, our dedicated project team members of who you've seen, a lot of us here, uh, our specialist advisors from across different professional groups, across the whole MDT um, and across the, the trust. Uh, so this is a whole trust, trust approach and um, and we're coming together to deliver this. Um, we're committed to using co-production and co-design into solutions with the people using services um, at every level. So um, in a moment, I'll share with you our, our governance structure, um, and, uh, which we've got specialist uh, expert experience within that. But also I'm sure the, the Rowan War team will express to you how they've used co-production at every step of the way in, in, their, in their development of their, their project. Um, we also believe that actually the engagement and sponsorship of the programme um, from our senior leaders, the senior matrons are, um, across the board. So there's a whole collective uh, approach to this and everyone signed up to this. Um, can I have the next click on? Click in. So, and, and one more click, please. Thank you. Um, and alongside this, uh, the approach of using quality improvement. So where we we're using the methodology to fully understand the problems, test new ideas, learn from them um, before we move to implementation and business as usual. Um, we also wanted to provide the space for people to, uh, for project teams to meet regularly, to learn and share with each other on in the improvement work. Um, and the last click. Thank you, Bav. And this, we believe, are, are the elements to help us to deliver on these three ambitions of the programme. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, and so, as I mentioned, just we've established a quality improvement board um, to oversee and deliver on this program, and, and, and um, of which there are numerous members of that. We've got Pete, who you you heard from just before, got us in, in the board on uh, on this on your screen here. Um, and this group is our, our internal group that we've developed to uh, operate and, and I guess act as a formal mechanism to deliver on this program. Um, and we will be overseeing all three work streams as they come online. Um, our initial focus obviously is restrictive practices um, or reducing restrictive practices work stream. Um, we are committed to using quality improvement methodology and frameworks to, to deliver on this. Um, and you, know, you can see on screen that the, the key factors and our objectives that we, we are focused on. So make, ensuring that um, the board will be ensuring that co-production at all levels is 
is a part of how we're delivering this work, um, and that's from um, understanding the problem through to the, you know, generating ideas through to the testing, etc., and, and the learning that we do. Um, uh, ensuring that the t project teams actually have the support that they need, so the time, the space to to meet, um, being uh, released to attend things like this, and and to share their work and and to connect with other people who are who are also working on this. Um, I've mentioned already about the committee for using the, the the quality improvement, but also we are going to be overseeing all of the data, so we will come together regularly to look at that, um, and but also. Um, to share and 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 celebrate where we've actually had improvements and and communicate in our learning. So, um, I'm not going to say very much more because I think you know in a way of how how we want to facilitate actually that that people can tell their stories and communicate those improvements. I'm going to hand over to my colleagues um, from Rowan Ward to tell their story. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, thank you, Toppy. Um, so yeah, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Sherlyn Joseph and I am one of the engagement and recovery workers on Rowan Ward, uh, Clown Road Hospital, and also the uh, one of the project team leads for reduced and restrictive practice. Um, like Toppy said, alongside me today, I've got my, my colleague Noel, um, who's, who's also an engagement and recovery worker and one of the project team leads. And, uh, We've also got uh, Sarah Adi Gallego, who unfortunately can't attend today, but she is one of the staff nurses and also one of the project team leads uh, for reduced restrictive practice. Um, so I guess our story so far, um, from the beginning when we were first informed of the reduced restrictive practice um, as part of the quality improvement project, we initially thought, well, this isn't going to be an easy task. Um, not only were a PQ ward uh, that faces extremely challenging situations on a daily basis, we're also faced with the task of initiating a cultural change within our organisation and the services that we provide. Um, to be honest, we were somewhat sceptical of how this change will actually occur, um, but we knew we had to start somewhere, so we basically began with an aim. And the aim of the project was to reduce restricted practice to 50% by the 31st of August, uh, December 2022. However, to be able to achieve this, um, we set out our own milestone um, and aimed to basically, you know, reduce restricted practice to 25% by June 2022. Um, the best way we decided that we can. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say next slide, please. <laughs> Um, the best way, um, oh yeah, so basically with the uh, reducing restricted practice, uh, we were basically focusing on uh, the number of seclusions, the number of restraints and the number of rap rapid tra tranquilizations that occur, um, you know, within our, our, sh our shifts um, on Rowan Ward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so engagement. Um, how do we do this? Well, we looked at how best uh, we engage with people who use our services. Um, so people who use our services discuss with our own team, um, putting together many ideas of therapeutic engagement, um, with activities being most agreed upon. Uh, the team recognised that incidents of violence and, and aggression occurred due to the lack of activities, which resulted in the use of restrictive practice. So. The next stage for us was to devise a timetable um, with various activities uh, to do during the course of each day of the week. And for this to take full effect, uh, we tested um, these activities with people who use our services and collected uh, the data. However, um, this wasn't always smooth sailing to begin with, um, as we faced um, sort of many challenges um, due to, for example, next slide please. And uh, next slide. And again, thank you. <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, so we had some challenges we faced were uh, it's basically the ward environments. Um, we've all heard the phrase, no two days are the same. Um, and Rome Ward really does live up to, to this phrase. Um, we're ever changing dynamics on the wards. 
always risk assessing. Those are times very difficult to engage with and achieve activities on a daily basis. Um, we also came against new leaderships um, at the early stages of the project. We went through managerial changes, um, which was a big hit for the, for the staff and morale. Um, however, in true Rowan style, we persevered and continued um, to put our hard work and best efforts into the project. And thirdly, data collection. Um, my colleagues and I um, came up with the ideas of creating a, or developing a safety cross. Um, this was to monitor the number of seclusions, um, restraints and rapid tranquilizations, occurrences and non-occurrences. Um, we also created an activity star um, to monitor the frequency of activities each day. However, it proved difficult uh, to get other team members updating these data. And we overcame this problem basically by allocating a member of staff for each shift whose responsibility is um, to update uh, the data at the end of the shift. Um, we also had wider team engagement. So we found difficulties trying to encourage uh, participation of the wider team um, with activities. Uh, this was resolved by explaining the purpose of uh, implementing activities and the aim of the project. Um, after all, I mean, our, our approach to engaging can mean the difference between failure and success. Um, with that being said, we come to success. Uh, basically, these tables here represent um, the number of restraints, seclusions and number of rapid tranquilizations um, that occurred um, uh, prior to and since uh, we've started creating the activity timetable and Rowan. Uh, the first table, the number of restraints, um, as you can see, the uh, prior to having the activity timetable, there were an average of uh, five number of restraints and our aim was to reduce this to an average of 3.75. Um, post activity timetable there's an average of two number of restraints which meant that we reduced the number of restraints by three. And the other the second table sorry um, is prior to having the activity timetable there were 2.4 uh, 2.14 average number of seclusions um, our aim was to reduce this to an average of 1.6 and post activity timetable there was a steady dip in the number of seclusions on Rowan. However, the data also shows a rise in seclusions as a direct result to the dynamics of the ward. And the third table shows the number of rapid tranquilizations um, prior to having the activity timetable. Um, there were a 1.29 average number of rapid tranquilizations. Um, our aim was to reduce this to an average of 0 0.96. And post activity timetable, we achieved an average of 0 0.5. Again, there was a spike in the data which reflects the dynamic shift of the ward. Um, but overall, our aim is our aim was to reduce restricted practice. And as the data has shown, we have seen. Uh, quite a significant reduction and improvements to what we set out to achieve. And with that said, I'll pass it on to my colleague No, who's no, sorry, who's going to talk about what's next uh, for Rowan Wars. No. Thank you, Sharon. Hello, everyone. As Sharon said, our project has been going on very well. It's uh, a bit slow at the moment because we do get uh, a lot. We were getting a lot of resistance from our, some of our colleagues because they did not want to engage into something that is new that was just uh, being introduced. And we also face difficulties in having a lot of uh, agency staff members who are working on the ward who did not have uh, the required training to be able to to restrain, uh, to be involved in uh, re reducing reducing restri re restrictive practice on the ward. And uh, on, as I cannot add much on what Shelan said, 
because uh, it's most of the things that we've been working on and the positives and negatives. Uh, I also like to add that uh, our activities were mainly they they are mainly engagement and recovery focus to reduce anxiety and improve coping strategies on the ward, which is something that we are aiming to stick to until we achieve uh, not 100 percent but close to 100 percent of uh, re reducing restrictive practice on the ward. But at the moment, the way it's going. It's in the positive direction. And also the pandemic, as I said earlier, was uh, something that slows uh, slowed us down in implementing the project. That's all I have for now. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Noam. Um, so basically, what's next for us? Um, um, Ruin, if we can go to, I think, the next couple of slides, please. Oh, sorry, if we go back one, actually, I'll, I'll just uh, speak about what we what we found there in the, in the uh, success bit. So here we have just a few feedback um, of successes uh, that we found since um, doing the project on reducing restrictive practice. Um, I'll just read out a few that I think were, were quite relevant. Um, one service user, um, mentioned that um, what we're doing is amazing and the ward feels more therapeutic and fun in comparison to my last admission to Rowan, which felt like punishment. So, I mean, that's that to me was like a really positive comment to, to hear from one of our service users. And it also reflects that what we're doing is, you know, is possible and is working. Um, I mean, people have also said it feels like the activities are helping to enhance relationships on the wards, which we have seen that it, it has sort of like made that rapport between staff and people who use the services more close. Um, whereas before there probably was like a little bit of a separation, you know, that sort of like, oh, your staff were patients sort of thing, you know, but now everyone's sort of like in a way becoming one, which is which is really good to see. Um, so what's next? Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so we're continuing to improve activity timetable. Um, so we've been working together with occupational therapies um, and devised one timetable for people who use the services um, to have a balance of therapeutic as well as stimulating activities on the ward. Um, we also aim to create CAM cards. Uh, these cards are to be implemented as part of the admission pack and outline supportive methods for people who use the services uh, during times of distress before using PRN medication. Um, the aim is that a copy of each individual's um, CAM card is also to be kept in key areas such as on their medication charts and in the nurse's office um, to be referred to when required. Uh, we also are looking at having more reflective practice um, as we all know, the ward environment can be a very challenging place and it's equally important for staff to have time to reflect on the challenges of the job. So I think Sherlyn's muted. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, I hope you, I hope you got most of those. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, so, uh, where am I? Oh, sensory boxes. Um, so we aim to improve also our sensory boxes and um, purchasing more sensory toys and equipment to stimulate all five senses and further support people who use the services. And we aim to revamp the activity room. So the future plans are to improve the activity room, making it a multifunctional space of fun and comfort, um, which we intend to have the inputs of people who use the services um, to make these changes because we feel that it's essential that it comes from them also, as it will be a space for, for everyone to be using. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, basically the Rowan Ward team, um, since taking on the project, uh, Rowan Ward has seen a reduction in violence and aggression, as well as the use 
of uh, restricted practice. Um, furthermore, a boost in morale uh, to people who use our services and staff. And retrospectively, there are further improvements to be made, and we are certainly taking a positive step um, in the right direction to make those changes. Um, we are a very proud team. Uh, we're very passionate and dedicated, and always striving to change and improve uh, the quality of care uh, for Sorry and Borders partnership. Um, with that said, uh, I only feel like it's it's right to leave you with with a quote that kind of reflects everything that we've we've experienced that we've done and that shows what we you know what is possible when when you work together. And that quote is basically um, culture does not change because we desire to change it. Um, culture changes when the organization is transformed. Um, the culture reflects the realities of people working together every day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sherlyn. That was absolutely amazing to hear. I, I didn't know what he was going to say. Um, uh, <laughs> and I don't want to uh, carry. I'm sorry to kind of cut in, but I'd like to invite my colleague Barbara also, who's coaching, who's been coaching the team to also just share some reflections. Um, don't want to dampen your light, uh, Sherlyn, but it'd be great to hear from Barbara also. Uh, thank you, Topo. Thank you, team. Uh, it's just really wanted to emphasize the great efforts from the Rowan team. Uh, it's been a journey ups and down, like every single journey. But uh, what we've seen both from the quantitative data and qualitative data, there are positive results. So I think one of the my one of my reflection as well was uh, when I was talking to Mada, the world manager, he said, actually, those things are possible. So I just really want to kind of emphasize that that uh, despite of the belief or assumption that certain things will not be possible on the PQ world, actually those things work, those things are possible. And we are making steady progress, learning about quality improvement uh, tools. So we use a fishbone diagram with the Rowan team. We built together driver diagram uh, also with uh, involving people who use the services that was done during the community meeting with bit of food so that was great as well and it's kind of those small changes those small uh, uh, really steps which are taking us uh, closer to the to the goal and uh, seeing the quote which Sherlan uh, kindly provided to us the reflection from one of the person who use our services is just so uh, really heartwarming and is the essence why we're doing that. And despite all the difficulties, the Rowan world really continue with the great work. So I'm hugely proud and I just really want to stay in the background and kind of help you guys to achieve even more. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you guys. Any questions for us? <laughs> for the team, really? We've got lots of great comments in the chat box um, about the great work you're doing. Um, there's a couple of questions. Uh, we've got one from Sarah saying, any presence here from the Learning Disability Directorate? I don't know if that's for you, Toppy. Um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head who is here, um, but actually uh, in terms of where we're going, how we're expanding the the program um, currently Rowan Ward was the first team um, that selected themselves to be involved and we're expanding um, uh, to include our other uh, divisions also so we're hoping to add more more teams onto the program so thank you thank you um, some comments here um, from Saika, who's um, one of our um, national coaches from the um, NCCMH and she acknowledges um, you know how important that cultural piece was um so thank you for that and i've got a hands up i can't quite see who it is i'm sorry i have to ask them to just step forward hi hi <laughs> thank well, you Seema. <laughs> just just a quick question to the amazing team they are part of my team anyway i'm so proud of them and just a quick question and about um how are you going to maintain this and more of like you reinforcing this great piece of work to move forward and bring along all the other new members of staff who will be joining the team? Uh, 
um, my SEMA. So I feel like um, our aim is just to any sort of like new members of the team that we, we introduce them to um, the projects and, and the ideas behind this and what we've done so far. And just basically just giving that um, constant encouragement uh, to people to make sure that they're engaging um, with, with, our, with our people who use our services. Um, and hopefully that becomes like, if, as it becomes a regular thing, it becomes more, not even like a routine anymore. It just becomes like just part of, you know, part of um, of, of the job, like what you should be doing. Um, I mean, since we've been doing this, like Noel said, it, it was a bit of a rocky start and just trying to get people to be a bit motivated into doing more activities in the ward. Uh, but before time, suddenly staff members, whether they're permanent or agency, come into the ward and they sit down with our, with our patients and they do activities and sometimes even come up with brand new ideas for activities, which is really great to see, like people just using their initiative um, so it doesn't feel like you have to sort of uh, encourage people anymore to, and say to them, oh, can you make sure you're doing this or can you make sure we do this activities? They're, they're willing to do it now and because I think because they're seeing that change, uh, they're recognising it and it just makes things much better for, for everyone in the, in the long run as well. You know, our, our service users are much happier, which then makes staff a lot happier as well. And then just the whole environment itself just becomes just a great place to be in. Um, so yeah, I guess it's just it's just to um, just make people aware aware of of the project. Um, and hopefully that's yeah, that will uh, work out for itself really. Thank you very much, Joseph Skills. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? Sorry, we missed that. Um, we've got a hand up. I was just saying thank you, Shirley. And I think that's, and again, that's a really nice story about the culture change where you're not having to give um, maybe every idea to the staff, they're coming back with them, um, where they're, they're really embedding, you know, the idea of change and quality improvement. Simon, we've got two hands up, one from Simon. Can I go first to Simon? Yeah, hi, everyone. Um... Simon Whitfield, Director of Quality Improvement at Surrey and Borders. Uh, great presentation, uh, team. Well, well done. Um, and it is heartwarming that that comment uh, from that person who uses services uh, about it being therapeutic. Um, I was picking up on uh, Seema's question. It's a great question, isn't it? About how do we keep this going? And um, and that uh, when I when when I was thinking about uh, that's our job. <coughs> collectively isn't it to <clears throat> keep the work going it's um and uh and part of that is first of all recognizing that we've still got a long way to go um we've still got a lot of work that we want to do um and we're still testing um and the other thing is that uh, we'll still be measuring so that will help us to see uh, how well we're doing but um so yeah so but it's not it wasn't um i just did, didn't feel it was uh, you're not on your own, guys. We're in this together. I think that's what I really wanted to say in, in making sure this uh, is sustained. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Simon. And I think um, I think that sort of um, that that voice from a senior stakeholder is is really helpful going forward, especially as these guys have had challenges. You know, they had lots of leadership change that they've alluded to at the the the, the beginning of the project quite early on. Um, and I think they worked really hard um, with the team around them to overcome that. So I think that's been the, the strength and watching you guys has been a, a privilege for me to, to see that all going on as well. Um, I'm just going to see if there's any more questions before we move on. Um, but a, again, if you've got any questions for Sherlyn and the team, um, we can pop them. I'm just going to double check the chat box to make sure I haven't missed anything. Um, but if not, we can uh, come back to them. I've just got um, Nenka saying, um, seeing positive change is a great motivation, but pushing on where there's no change is great. Yeah, 
that that feels almost like a quote, Minka. It really does, because I think it's, I mean, it's success is easy to kind of celebrate and share, isn't it? But those times early on when you're not seeing much change, when you're doing that, um, that um, data collecting in the early days, I think that's the challenge to keep everybody's enthusiasm up. Thank you so much. That was really interesting and, and helpful and inspiring. And again, I have to echo what Simon says to actually hear a service user talking about um, it feeling a much better space and not the punishment they felt before is is um, is wonderful to hear and, and a, a reflection on all your hard work. So thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? And I'll um, so just a, little, a few updates. Um, we're on time because I'm aware that people need to get away for school runs and everything, so I won't take too long. But if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so just really a look at where we are now. Um, we have got a, our new commission is due to come out. We don't know the full detail of it yet, but we, we know that there's going to be a, more emphasis on reducing restrictive practice and scale up as well. So um, really good to see that our wards are moving forward. And um, we're really getting um, we, we're getting some data in. We can share, see the progress Rowan's been making, and and just understanding those changes they're making. So I think that will really help us as we scale up over the next year with the program. So these are the wards that are um, with KMPT, SPFT, and SABP at the moment, um, and and everybody's at various different stages. But that works really well in QI because we can do lots of learning and sharing between us, and and I'll be include continuing to try and link everybody up um, through the MHC, through our own sets um, and with SICA as well, supporting us at a national level. So we're super lucky to have um, SICA to support us as well. Next slide, please. So I, I think taking away from today, we, we've heard some really strong stories um, from our presenters, um, both in real change we have to make in terms of policy and those governance things, um, and adopting um, new changes like Shaney's Law, but actually also some really strong stories. And I just wanted us to all have a bit of time to think over the next few days um, about how that would change you. I know it's, I know I'm going to make some changes and there are some language changes that I heard, but also some, um, you know, that hand up the mountain, it was uh, in inspirational. Um, and then my next question is how can we scale up and, and shore up the work that everybody's been doing already so that the, the changes become embedded the way Sherlin said, and they're already looking for the next changes. So I just wanted to really leave you with those thoughts, really. And final slide, please. So we have got some, oh, that says 8th of March. I'm so sorry, that should, that's completely the wrong date in there. That's not very helpful. We have got a celebration um, day coming up. And it was um, a suggestion from one of my colleagues in KMPT, Dan, I'm sure he won't mind me naming him, about at some point it'd be really nice to bring clinical teams together um, to, to really celebrate what we've done. So I'll be contacting you all as well and asking you for storyboards that we could bring from each of the wards involved, no matter where your journey is. Um, you know, we heard again from Roman today, and we've heard from Amber before about wherever you are in the journey, there's learning to share. Um, and it's, I think off the top of my head, Bab and Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, that should say the 17th um, of May and apologies. Um, and again, um, we'll just be doing some learning sets. We're doing, we're working with Psycho at the moment um, to come together across um, Kent, Surrey and Sussex as QI leads. And we'll be looking at, at extending that to other groups as well. In terms of the um, mental health collaborative, Again, we've got the wrong date on there. I do apologise. I think the long, wrong slide must have come over. Um, we have some dates coming up there, and I'm going to be sharing those with the network as we go forward. But just to draw your attention to um, the two-hour monthly coaching sessions, um, they're the last Tuesday of every month. The, um, you can join up with them on there. Oh, we're skipping forward as well. Um, you can join on there, and they're very informal sessions. Um, but I think anybody that's been to them, we ha we've had some really rich conversations um, and around things like equality and diversity, which which gave the steering group some of the ideas for, for today's agenda. So if you do get time and come with questions, um, we have a jam board open and people can anonymously put questions on. And then you have lots of people from different trusts. So there's 16 different trusts that sign in. 
um, bringing their thoughts and ideas. And we do a lot of problem solving. The two hours always go super quickly, um, but we, we get some good sharing on there. Thank you, Karen's put the right date in the chat box. Thank you for saving me there, Karen. Um, I just want to open up in case anybody's got any final thoughts they'd like to share before we close um, the event. So please feel free to come off camera or write anything um, in the box. Oh, thank you for coming, Sam. It was lovely to, to have you on the group. Anything else from anybody? Brilliant. Um, please feel free to write in the chat box. We can, we'll visit it afterwards if there's anything you want to say. Um, we will be sending out a recording um, which will hold the slides as well and all the presentations. Um, presenters. If you did have any uh, questions that you wanted to carry on with, then please let me know.